Awesome. Fantastic. All right. So, set. So, um, most of you actually look like familiar faces, but if you're not introduced, I'm Hugh Carey, Space Association Australia member, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm a 23 year old recent graduate. Uh, I do software dev full time. Uh, part time, I'm building a satellite, uh, which is why I went to the IAC. Uh, it's quite cool. Could have said. Uh, and I am an absolutely massive space geek, that is true. So, uh, yeah, bit of backstory. I, I wasn't always uh, this old, I suppose. I did grow up, I had a, kid, a childhood, and uh, throughout my childhood, I've always been a bit of a tinkerer, liked taking stuff apart, trying to put it back together. It's a little bit less successful. But uh, so always sort of liked building a bunch of stuff from animatronic heads to high voltage tasers, flamethrowers, lemon cannons, sugar rockets, bit of a destructive streak. But uh, most of what I did, I did with my best mate, Mike. Uh, so yeah, that's us as kids. Um, and so two years ago when I was studying at Swinburne, uh, I was loving life, cruising along, um, enjoyed being a student, a software dev. Uh, but... Mike passed away two years ago, and that really shook me to my core, and I realized that space is sort of a big passion, and I wasn't doing space, so I've got to get on with it and do something. So my goal was to get something into space by sending my mate Mike's ashes into space. So I had to ask myself, uh, was it possible? Yes, it's quite possible. Uh, how hard can it really be to build a satellite? <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily easy, but um, certainly not too hard. So, started out with some uh, baby steps, uh, simple basic model, literally built out of cardboard and sticky tape for a CubeSat. You just got to, uh, you know, start uh, researching the CubeSat standard, which is an international standard out there. Uh, basically, you get a 10 centimeter cube, much like you, finding out the size of the satellite. <laughs> uh, so, basically, you find out what size you've got to work with and uh, take it from there. The wings pop out. Oh, they're so realistic. <laughs> So uh, it really is baby steps, and I just wanted to start by making something physical, really, you know, working on it. So uh, when you progress past uh, sticky tape and cardboard, you add in some free computer-aided design software, you can actually start to get something that sort of resembles maybe a finished product. Uh, it costs zero dollars to do this, really, uh, which is fantastic that that's the day and age we live in. It's all free software, and it's just uh, the time and effort that you choose to put into it. Um, so this was uh, an initial sort of, it was never going to be flight hardware, there were no circuit boards designed or anything, but uh, you know, I figured out the power requirements that I expected that it would need, not much more than a spreadsheet, some solar panel calculations. Those are modelled with common over-the-shelf uh, 18650 lithium cells, just to sort of get an idea of how things would fit together and how it would progress. Uh, I experimented with some <laughs> seriously disgusting ideas that... Uh, wouldn't work, but you know it's it's all progress and it was early days. This is all in the first week of my deciding to do this, so it's it's a rapid development project, obviously. Um, this is when it started to get from beyond the pixels into the real world. So utilizing 3D printing uh, really accelerates the development. This was the first 3D print I ever got, and unfortunately, it was sized wrong <laughs> by the printer. <laughs> but uh, they rebuilt it sent it back, and uh, when it finally did get the right size, it was pretty good. So I still had a physical object to work with, and I'd already realized some things about the structure that wouldn't work, but I realized a lot of things that would, and I knew that I had enough to sort of continue moving on. Um, so this is sort of some real development. Uh, now I'm focusing on things like an antenna deployment. Obviously, uh, with a CubeSat standard, everything's got to fit within the 10 centimeter cube to begin with, and so things have to move and unfold. So this was an early, early computer prototype. Again, didn't make it to the real world, but tested some of the mechanisms for deployment. Hinges were non-existent at that point. Figured I'd figure it out along the way. The antennas unfolding, of course. And so, progressing through the development, this was the first sort of all the way from pixels to the real world incarnation. So, it uh, had all the systems that you sort of need. Had power systems, real life printed circuit boards, the first PCBs I ever designed. Got them fabricated up in China. These are some uh, models that I generated online whilst I couldn't wait for the PC boards to come. When they did, I was so excited. <laughs> first uh, bits of a satellite in my hand. First uh, physical test of putting them all together. You notice the internal stack is all just proto boards that I designed for the 
there are minimum order quantities still and I'm at zero dollar budget at this point pretty much. So I sort of had to work on the panels that I needed multiples of, get them fabricated and then custom make the, the boards for the internals out of uh, my own sort of yeah, design. So uh, if this video works, this is at the first ever test of the solar array and antenna deployment done on mum's kitchen table, of course, just like NASA. <laughs> the, uh, they are, of course, uh, tape measure um, in the initial version and blue tack isn't a structural element, obviously, which is why the first antenna went flying out, but it was still a fairly successful deployment nonetheless. Validated a lot of design concepts, um, invalidated some others. But uh, it's all a learning experience up to this point. Yeah, so probably not the most interesting procedure, but uh, it did work. Uh, so this was one month in. Um, so I was just playing around in SketchUp, which is a free program by Google. It's fantastic, though. Uh, progressed to AutoCAD now. But uh, yeah, sort of working on my virtual design table, filled that up in a, about a month and had essentially sort of a somewhat working prototype physical deployment, it fits within the CubeSat standard. The solar uh, charging and power subsystem was tested on a workbench, so not actually in the physical model, but all of that worked. There was uh, pretty much everything aside from the sort of the final computer flight hardware, which uh, expensive processors that I couldn't afford at that point, and uh, the actual transmitter electronics, because at that point I didn't know anything about radio transmitters. We're getting there. But uh, yeah, so that was about four weeks of development and uh, we've gotten fairly far. So where am I now? Um, this was about 18 months ago you saw that. So the project has been upgraded to a 3U CubeSat standard. So it's a 30 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube now. Uh, fits a little bit more in there. The main addition is the payload, which is a linear electromagnetic accelerator that I designed. Um, and I think it solves many of the issues with financing a launch. So that was obviously going to be the biggest hurdle. A one man space program, how am I going to get $65,000 plus for a launch cost, American. Um, obviously crowdfunding these days is something that's fantastic and taking off if uh, it doesn't go an investor and tra traditional sales route. Uh, with the linear electromagnetic accelerator, I plan to bind people's ashes to a ferromagnetic slug, accelerate it out of the back of a satellite, and that way it can uh, be put onto a targeted targeted atmospheric injection trajectory where it will uh, burn up and scatter the ashes and it will be visible as a shooting star anywhere on the earth at your desired time. So yeah, yeah, take that to Kickstarter, maybe like $2,000 a pop is what the spreadsheet says it might do. And yeah, maybe you can actually get this thing into launch. Um, and so in building the linear electromagnetic accelerator, I realized that I don't think anyone's ever put one on a satellite before. So I wrote a pretty cool paper about its scientific uses like uh, putting temperature sensors or atmospheric anything, maybe in the eye of a hurricane anywhere on Earth. Uh, global warming is obviously a, a big problem that we can solve with space-based satellite services and stuff. And so I wrote a bit about that. Um, and the paper got accepted by the University of Iowa. Hey, I'm so excited. And then I spoke to a lawyer. <laughs> they said, you've really got a patent, at least some of the things here, before you present. And so I had to withdraw my presentation. And so I can't really talk about anything to do with the 3U or give you any nice pictures. But hopefully uh, I'm going to resubmit it for presentation when I've sorted this patent stuff out next year at Germany in the IASA. So we'll come back and present a little more. So uh, Michael asked me to put together a little photo slideshow of sorts of the, uh, the time at the IASA. So I'll just run through those now. Uh, yeah, it was that was just at registration. It's honestly one of the best weeks of my life. I was so chuffed. Already had like three great conversations with rocket scientists. Uh, just met the head of liquid rocket propulsion development at the Indian Space Research Organization, which is fantastic. Uh, oh, that's the abstract for my uh, really longly worded <laughs> um, paper, using linear electromagnetic acceleration of satellite payloads for targeted atmospheric injection and orbital trajectory adjustment. Um, and yeah, they accepted it for presentation, so I was really happy that was sort of validation of some of my thoughts. There's a lot more that goes along with it, I'll be able to show you some other time. When they accepted, I was so excited. Uh, so driving to Adelaide wasn't the best, but uh, I wanted to take some of the physical satellite models, um, the prototypes as they currently are, the 3U version, to show potential collaborators and stuff, and didn't want to risk getting that on a plane, lost a big bunch of wires and circuit boards, so I thought I'd drive. Uh, it was well worth it. This was the opening ceremony of the IAC. They did a, an Aboriginal ceremony where they started a fire and 
this amazing smoke wafting around that really had a palpable buzz for everyone in the audience. Obviously, Senator Birmingham announcing the space agency. Everyone was applauding. Uh, there were two guys from the Indian Space Agency next to me who laughed and couldn't believe that we didn't already have a space agency. So that was pretty depressing. <laughs> but better late than never. Um, Charles Bolden receiving an award during the opening ceremony, the World Space Award. It was fantastic to see some of these people that I've only seen on a screen before uh, in real life. And the audience was captivated throughout. Uh, they finished with a uh, presentation from the Adelaide Youth Orchestra. Really spectacular. And this was the first uh, plenary session on the day that I was uh, lucky enough to attend. So it was the Heads of Agencies panel, which at the IAC is traditionally one of the, the, the best plenary sessions. Um, it brings together heads of various space agencies. You've got Sylvain Laporte from the Canadian Space Agency, Naoki Okamura uh, in white there from JAXA, Tian Yulong from the Chinese National Space Agency, Igor Komarov from Roscosmos, uh, plus not pictured is Jan Werner from European Space Agency, Robert Lightfoot from NASA. He's the, uh, the new acting administrator since uh, Charles Bolden left. Sri Somanath, he's the liquid rocket propulsion development at the ISRO, and it was moderated by Dr. F. He got asked a fantastic question at the end, Igor. Um, it was what his dream is for collaboration between space agencies. He said, I want a mission designed by the US, built by the European Space Agency, with tracking provided by the Canadian Space Agency and JAXA, with something from China, I can't remember, but launched on a Russian super heavy rocket. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, although a bit of a somber mood in general because uh, there were a lot of questions about China's interaction and how they're banned from the space station and stuff. But, uh, you know, it was, it was good. It's, it's places like the IAC where this sort of cooperation is fostered and, yeah, things get done. So, yeah, more of the audience. It was uh, fantastic the whole time. This is uh, what the technical sessions look like. This is what I would have been presenting in. Just a small sort of room with some rocket scientists. There's Bill Nye in the second row. Not sure if you can see him just there. Did get to meet him. He's a nice guy. <laughs> um, this is our very own Andrea Boyd on the left here, who speaks for the space station, uh, working through ESA with her dual, I think it's Italian citizenship. Lovely lady. Um, fantastic to see how many Aussies are really in the aerospace industry, uh, overseas and in Australia. Getting to talk to some of them. are all pictures. Oh well, not sure what they were. Anyway, uh, I think that was actually ESA pictures on, they did uh, some interesting presentations on their reusable rockets concept, which is much the same as a Falcon 9, goes up, does a boost back burn and lands, but uh, they're not even looking at it until after Ariane 6 is finished. So five, six, seven years down the track, maybe we'll see something from them. Uh, NASA, the 3D printed labs challenge, always fantastic. There are a lot of students that worked on it there. Great to see some STEM encouragement, involvement with uh, the next generation of space people. Uh, these were the other sort of sessions. So there's sort of ma four main things at the IAC. There's the plenary sessions like the agency panel, the technical sessions and these interactive presentations. We really get to talk to the people as they're discussing their ideas. This is the showroom floor where all of the uh, big agencies set up. This is Rocket Lab from New Zealand. They brought a whole stage two of an Electron rocket, which was fantastic. Um, got to talk to Peter Beck uh, a little bit. Um, I asked him what it's like running a rocket company. He said, tiring, as you can imagine. But uh, yeah, fantastic to get to uh, lay my hands on a real rocket. That one's made out of carbon fiber, and really when you're touching it, it really is just that thin, this thing. And uh, the 3D printed engine, of course. Um, being able to touch that and really feel that you can actually see the polygons from the, the model have been 3D printed as well. Uh, Lockheed Martin had a big display there. Um, they sponsored the event uh, before Elon showed them up on Friday. Uh, so they had uh, some fantastic models of uh, the Orion spacecraft and some satellites that they've built. And some this one is the Hayabusa 2 probe from JAXA, which is going to go do another comet landing and asteroid return sample. Uh, Boeing brought a full-size mock-up of the CST-100 Starliner where you could get in and the mission was just off with the space station. And when you did successfully do it, you got one of these mission patches. And uh, I did it twice, so a bit of trivia. What color are the spacesuits that Boeing have developed for use in the CST-100? Can you see the presentation? Oh, I did. 
this is where they're going to be asked. So yes, they are blue. Very blue. Um, some truly fantastic models on display there. Obviously, most people don't bring the real thing. Um, just way good. Just awesome quality on the Mars 2020 rover. Photo taken by a friend that I met there, Alex. Credit where due. Uh, the Indian Space Agency chose to bring gold-plated rockets to show off. <laughs> Pretty blingy. Um, this is from uh, the DSR. I can't remember what it stands for, but the German Space Agency. They're currently working on designing a plant growth module for the space station. And so they've built a mock-up in a shipping container, and they're shipping that out to the Arctic to test what it's like. DLR, they're also doing uh, some fantastic stuff with plant growth on satellites. So this is the Eutropus mission. Um, in each half, there's a tomato plant, and it's spin stabilized for the first six months of the mission to replicate Martian gravity, to see how the tomatoes will develop in Martian gravity. Then it's slowed down, and the other half of the experiment kicks off in a lunar gravity tomato. Just uh, so it's sort of, you know, just finding out uh, how we're going to grow crops on Mars and lunar surface. Um, <coughs> Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, so another technical session that was related. Uh, lots of plant growth stuff this year. Uh, obviously, feeding humans in space, humans on other planets, big challenge. Plants don't like it to grow. Uh, at the start of Friday was uh, Lockheed Martin's big Mars Base Camp presentation. Um, here's their Mars Base Camp in orbit. Uh, it starts off with a habitation module and solar, like on the left, and they build it up to add fuel depots. And uh, these things on either end are actually in Orion. Uh, so they use those, the flight deck and all of the computers of those as sort of the base uh, to get a little transport module. Then come the cool looking version of the SpaceX VFR, which is, uh, as far as I know, unnamed. But uh, it's got like four delta wings. Looks pretty cool. Runs on liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen instead of uh, SpaceX's liquid methane, liquid oxygen, and uh, it has full aboard at every point. It doesn't need to be fueled on the ground before it can get back up, so offers a little more safety. I think they're playing for the NASA, maybe Fundus sort of angle. Uh, and here it is on the surface, obviously. Um, so hopefully we'll see both of these fantastic solutions in the next couple of years. Uh, there was a few social events. This was the SpaceX Reddit meetup group. Uh, lovely bunch of people. A couple of photos were from this guy, Alex. But uh, yeah, it was it was a great social event for the IAC. There was a lot of sort of meetups after hours. This one was really good because it got us in contact with some SpaceX people. So when it came to the Elon Musk presentation, this was two hours before people queuing up. This was taken by one of our friends. And then this was an hour before all of that area is filled up. And thanks to the SpaceX Reddit meetup, I was sitting in the air-conditioned VIP area, which was fantastic. So here we all were, waiting with the media people and a couple of, you know, people <laughs> and uh, yeah it was fantastic because we got to sit as we came in everyone else was seated and this was a another friend's photo we're up there fourth row from the front so it was fantastic could have thrown an apple at Elon uh, SpaceX logo um, becoming a multi-planetary species obviously looks like he's doing some finger guns there but it was just fantastic to get to see this true visionary speaking uh, in person um, obviously uh, it's, m it's massive the uh, the rocket the BFR, so it's scaled down from last year, but uh, obviously next to the space station, it's absolutely massive. He's also shown his plans for the, the future Mars city coming along, and uh, he wants to get boots on Mars by 2024. So some people think it's really ambitious, but uh, hopes to send some cargo there in 2022. I think interesting was set up propellant plant comes after people land, so there's no way to get back when he's first sending people there. Hopefully the propellant plant works. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was truly fantastic stuff, and um, it was a real buzz, and it was a great way to sort of finish off. This was the last big presentation for the uh, the week, and we all went for some drink drinks afterwards, had a great chat about uh, what we think will work and won't work, because obviously we're more informed than Elon. Uh, wrapped up the whole week with the gala dinner, which was fantastic, great way to uh, meet some more people. This photo was actually taken by the head of, I think it was Gilmore Space, the rocket company, so... Yeah, it was awesome. And uh, whilst I was in Adelaide, got to check out the Australian space, the, the exhibition. So they've got some cutaways of some uh, flight-worthy hardware that never got launched for whatever reason, some recovered rocket engines. Um, this one crashed in the desert. I think this is part of the uh, Black Arrow. I'm not sure. 
But uh, yeah, fascinating to see these engines that powered Australia into space uh, and then crashed in the desert. This uh, was pretty awesome, actually. It was a flag that was flown to lunar orbit, uh, lunar orbit, <laughs> blanking out KFC, lunar orbit on uh, Apollo 11, and so stayed in the command module. Some fragments of lunar soil were covered by Neil and Buzz uh, on display at South Australia, so that was awesome. And yeah, I got some freebies. I asked one of the ladies. I said I was coming from the Space Association of Australia, and she gave me a whole bunch of postcards and bookmarks, so I think I'll pass those around as many as you can and uh, yeah that's it so got to play around actually got to drive uh, this replica of the Curiosity rover that was built for a Qantas commercial with uh, normal remote control it was fantastic and uh, yeah it was a really fantastic time though Um, I'm aiming for a launch in 2021. Uh, uh, 2021, <laughs> some of mine's best years, and that obviously seems like a realistically workable time frame. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm sort of doing well. Like, I'm not going to trick myself. Uh, the, none of the prototypes I've got are quite ready, obviously. There's a long way to go. But, um, yeah, I, I come from a software development background, so there's a lot of iterative development cycles, you know, build fast, test fast, see what doesn't work, do it again and again. And um, with eBay, J. Carl Bunnings, and cheap Chinese people, you can really do it for uh, it's not a lot. Man operation. Oh yeah, it's a lot of men operation. It's plus a lawyer now. So <laughs> yeah. I, it's it's insane. The ratio of lawyer cost and development cost yeah. is in average like seven to one. So uh, yeah, it's pretty difficult. But it's awesome because you can do anything you want. Right. So arm snow? Nah, do not. Do you? So this is the twenty twenty which looks forever. Um, this is the oh okay, okay. Cool. So that's this. One more guess. Uh, two 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 thirds. Seventy five. Seventy five percent. But uh, yeah, it was awesome. And uh, yeah. any other questions? Hugh, you, you, you mentioned um, sixty five thousand dollars for a launch. Um, can you tell us who's going to get tickets? Uh, so there's actually websites. I think um, I was speaking to Peter Beck. Uh, I can't remember the figure that he told me, and it may have been in Neil and Buzz's as well. But uh, sixty five thousand is a figure that I've seen. Quoted a lot um, within the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, I know there's uh, some uh, like ISA launch, there is you charge an SS $120,000. Uh, there is others uh, significantly less, but they haven't launched yet. Uh, I know there's an Australian team, I can't remember the name, but they haven't started launching for a couple of years and they are there since like 2023. So uh, obviously, mine's a big thing whether they get there. You wouldn't do any harm to keep in touch with you directly and keep it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Is the sixty five thousand for one cube? One yeah, that is for one year. So you want to go to three years. But the two thousand dollar figure I was uh, estimating on my spreadsheets, I was actually factoring in for each last launch vehicle. It's it's not straight up three times, despite yeah. it being three times the size of my just because there's a lot of paperwork and stuff, obviously, and lots of overhead. Um, but yeah, I think uh, without going into the facts and figures too much, like a Kickstarter crowdfunding is a really reasonable option. Uh, although I'm hoping that uh, the Indie Gemini Startup Accelerator that flowed uh, from Moonshot applied to that, which is a developed business model. I mean, I'm, I'm more of an energy person than anything else, so yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, I'm surprised that you can design an electromagnetic accelerator which can fit in such a tiny space. Yeah. Capable of accelerating something fast enough to change its orbit sufficiently to get it to re-enter. Yes. Um, so you need about for a 500 kilometer circular orbit on a satellite, you need something between 72 and 80 meters a second. Is what I my calculations show should offer a guaranteed re-entry, um, and that is achievable. Uh, guaranteed. The slugs are very small, obviously, okay. and uh, linear electromagnetic accelerator that much capable of uh, scale a lot bigger, a lot easier. Um, Significantly more power available and significantly more you can do. It's something about that size of a Hubble. You should be able to then use that to launch a CubeSat size payload with a sizzling that can enter it. So uh, there's a lot of room to scale it up and it does get a lot easier on the order of average. So I'm hoping that I will eventually be able to fit all of the electronics in at three years. Uh, it's a tight fit, obviously, and there's significantly more power to be eked out of it. It works on a test bed, but in terms of a CubeSat, not material. Even storing enough. Power on board. Yeah, capacitor technology is 
come along there. It's, it's free to buy them, and I mean, they are some decent investors, but uh, I've got to save up, get some legal costs out of it, and then save up and buy some really expensive passwords and just get to eke out the maximum efficiency. And then you just know that you get what happens to your uh, yeah, so with some actual careful trajectory planning, you can use it to boost your orbit. Um, obviously, in my mission scenario, it, uh, it is used, like, the re-entry is targeted uh, on a specific time and place based on customer needs, so you don't get all that much. But uh, for the 25 payloads that can fit uh, and be objected, you're looking at something like a 2.1 meter a second delta V change. So it's not significant at this scale, but uh, something like the size of the Hubble, if you were Asteroid dynamicist, and you were planning your trajectories well, you can probably, you know, extend the useful life of the satellite in your orbit by a couple of meters. Are you um, going to fabricate all your own electronics? Uh, uh, well, there's I mean, a lot of off-the-shelf stuff available for the uh, processors, of course, there and is. the telemetry and that sort of thing. And I got to talk to uh, some of those suppliers, IAZ, and I also got to talk to some of the users of it, which was really interesting uh, experience, because I won't name names, but there was one particular supplier um, who I spoke to two separate people and both of their missions had been failed because this off-the-shelf power pack was available. Mm -hmm. So if you build it all in-house, not only do you keep the cost down, but uh, you at least know what's going wrong with it or what eventually does go wrong. Um, a lot of, spoke to a lot of people in mission planning and design and uh, these days they essentially say that they build them so that if you hit it with a hammer, it will get done. Because as long as you can do that by sending a radio command or something that you can Trigger a safe mode, you can do this, get yourself back online. It all sort of goes in there, you know, killing it ground for the life of it. Awesome. <laughs> I know that SpaceX read it to me for a bit, but how did that come up in your meetings? Um, well, I guess one person on there was like, can I grab a drink? And then all the other people were like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, one of them had been to uh, Guadalajara and met uh, the IAC last year. And SpaceX person, they got in a chat with a PR person, and uh, they managed to get us like walking seats in the VIP area. Um, we put these little stickers on our badges, and we just get along. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Cool. It's great, yeah. It was good fun. Surprising everyone didn't come to you. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of empty seats, which was often surprising. Yeah. But yeah, it was absolutely packed in the back, and people waited three hours plus outside. Well, there's a plan to use the solar radiance. Mm -hmm. haven't looked into that, to keep you posted. But uh, basically, it always will fire in a retrograde orbit. Uh, the only, I can just barely get the amount of power necessary for this, uh, 72 meters a second delta V, I'm estimating to be required. And uh, yeah, you can only get that by firing in a pure retrograde. Anything else, you're probably gonna get skimming on the atmosphere and then re-entry after a couple of orbits. Um, but yeah, it fires in a pure retrograde, so it does have to be passing over a particular time, hence why I'm going for a highly Highly inclined polar orbit, just so that I do maybe recover from the orbit that I started. Did, so 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 did someone attempt that as some kind of weapon and therefore? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the there's a big chance that when I go to Vietnam and get this patent through, it turns out that there is like a, you know, a military patent, a SWAT patent or something that it's uh, crossing with. So uh, I'm not talking about the patent, but I mean, talking about the actual. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, make that the satellite. Yeah, and I mean, you fire it in the wrong direction, and suddenly you're getting a little bit long term on your head. A little bit. Oh, Tesla syndrome, by the way, you're just creating more debris. But uh, yeah, I don't mind doing it in these intersections. So. Yeah. I'm just, but there's these international yeah. treaties and there certainly is. Weapons and stuff that do that. But uh, I mean, there's a web of laws that I can make. <laughs> just get more debris along. Actually, there was a weird hush hush vibe there where everyone was like, you know, don't give way too much just in case it's not very reliable. I mean, they're building themselves, they really are. Yeah, it's a good target. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Well, right. so what we'll do is to maybe have you back, uh, give us updates yeah, yeah. on meetings on many civilian milestones as you get to Yeah, yeah. Now, interesting fact the Space Association, I've done a study, and we're, we're in the top 20 percent of the uh, income levels in Australia in citizenship. So, there might be some wealthy, <laughs> wealthy individuals here or in the you know, network that might want to come and use the uh, 50 grand or so. <laughs> I'll just write you a cheque for that. Yeah, there you go. Let's rub one over. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.
Thanks.